you may ask why are we here? We're here because uh, part of the town is uh, in the process of uh, putting together a grant. Uh, we've already gotten initial grant to begin the packaging of our... So our purpose today is to dive into Hadley and all the areas that we think we are very vulnerable. But well, we have a Google engineering consulting firm with us, Comprehensive Environmental. I'll be calling on them to take over and then give us more detail of the workshop. We also, um, you're also here because we consider you one of the stakeholders, one of the major players that will be able to help us put together information that we may need. I'm very grateful for your presence. We have uh, um, a lot of people here that are at key locations. We have the select board, we have the fire chief, we have the planning, we have uh, finance, which we are very grateful because we need their endorsement. With so, and then uh, we also have conservation who has been playing a big role for us and also sometimes policing us, make sure that we are in line with uh, <laughs> So, I will call on David Roman from the uh, Comprehensive Environmental to also introduce the panel or the team and then go from there. Yeah. So, David? Thanks. So, I'll actually have Bob kind of start that, I think, right? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, good morning, everyone. Thanks again for, uh, for coming out and, and spending your day doing this. My name is Bob Hartzell with uh, Comprehensive Environmental. And with my colleagues here, Alicia Musgraves and Dave Roman, who will be helping to guide the workshop. So um, the way that we're going to do this, um, we're going to spend a little time up front, just kind of giving you an overview of like why we're here, the structure of how we're going to do this planning workshop, the exercises that we're going to you know use to kind of pull your local information into the plan. Um, that'll probably take less than an hour. We're hoping like maybe 45 minutes, and then we, within that, we're going to give just a little bit of an overview of some of the science of climate change that. Um, you know, I'm sure we're not, you know, we don't want to educate you on this. I think most of you probably understand climate change, but we want to lay the groundwork so that um, you're thinking in the right context as we're trying to pull information that's specific to Hadley. So the main thing to keep in mind is um, this is a two-step process. As, as Chris mentioned, we're here to do this you know, planning workshop today, but the real reason is there's a second phase to this MVP, or the Municipal Vulnerability Preparedness Program, which is what this is. The next phase is where the big money is, and that is the action and implementation grants. So you get a little bit of money now, money now to run this workshop, and then the priorities and the actions that come out of this you use to actually get cash to build things and improve things for the town. So right now, it's, like, it's, a, it's a pretty important uh, job you're doing. You're really setting the table for a, a lot of funding that will come uh, in the years uh, down the road. So. Um, there is going to be shortly arriving a representative from the state uh, office of executive executive office of energy and environmental affairs, uh, the regional coordinator for this program. He said he'd be here around 9:15. He had childcare drop off, so as soon as he's here, he'll give a little overview of the program from the state uh, perspective. So after that 45 minutes of overview, we'll shift into these guided exercises with these little tables we'll be filling in um, that you can see on the easels. So with that said. Um, if we could just maybe go around the room, just uh, introduce ourselves so everyone knows who everyone else is, or at least for our, for our purposes, you might all well know each other. So um, maybe if we could start at this table, that would be sure. great. Um, I'm Tony Linarelli. I'm a climate change scientist and um, adjunct professor at University of Massachusetts, research ecologist with the U.S. Geological Survey, and I'm on Hadley's Conservation Commission. Well, we've got some superstar power here. <laughs> oh, yes. Jim Stone, the Healthy Conservation Agent. Edwin Matusko, Conservation Commission and CTA Committee and local farmer in town. Jim Axelowski, Planning Board. I'm Drew <laughs> Hutchison, and I'm the director of Hadley Media. <laughs> Amy Fiden, and I am the Finance Committee. Sharon Gifford, DPW. Haley Wood, um, Senior Services. Annie McKenzie, Superintendent of Schools. And Chris knows I have a, another meeting I have to go to, so I'm just here briefly this morning. My apologies. Oh, Mike Spangable, Fire Chief and uh, Emergency Management Director. Chris Oka for Hadley 
All right. And our most recent arrivals. <laughs> David Nixon, town administrator. <laughs> <laughs> and Jennifer Sanders James, assistant procurement officer. All right, great. Well, that sounds like a really uh, good distribution of skill sets and knowledge for the town. So I think this will be this will be very helpful, as you see. Um, we want to make sure that as we go through this exercise, that you keep three major categories in mind. So when we talk about climate vulnerability and what that means to the town, it's not just flooding or you know, roads, um, bridges washing out. It's, we want to think three major categories. So the three categories are infrastructure, things like roads and bridges, and culverts, uh, societal, so that would be things like, is there a school or maybe a senior living center that might be isolated in a flood so that ambulances and emergency vehicles can't get to them? Um, and the last is environmental. So that could be anything from floodplains that, or, or riverbanks that get washed out and damaged, um, pockets of rare species that are known that might be a, th a threat to new invasive species coming up from the south as the climate warms. So three major categories, um, infrastructure, societal, and environmental. So we want to make sure that you know, you're thinking in that context and not getting pigeonholed into one way of thinking about you know, climate impacts. So um, this would be the point where we would get the overview from our uh, EOA uh, representative who's not here yet. So we're just going to skip past that and I will we'll go back that, uh, in a bit. Okay. So I've already mentioned a little bit about, actually, you know, everyone's okay. Hopefully, you get enough coffee in you so you don't fall asleep from the mood lighting. You know, shift too. You know? um, I think the bigger risk of mood lighting is right after lunch. Science is true, and that's like the perfect time to fall asleep. So, um, so I think I mentioned before, where there's, this is a this is the first step of the process. So you've already the town's already obtained the planning grant. That's what we're doing here today. We're going through the planning uh, workshop. So once we complete the workshop, it'll be our job as consultants to basically take all the information that comes out of everyone's brains today and write a rep report and have a prioritized list of actions. So that's the next step. And so once you've got that report done, you submit it to the state, and they approve it, review, maybe they got some comments, but then you become a certified MVP community. And at that point, the gates open for funding to implement all the priorities that you identified today. So we're going to use, um, as you'll see, you know, this, this chart here, that's not a chart that, that we came up with, and the process that we're going to go through today is not our own. It's kind of uniform across the state, every community that does this is going to do it in the same way. So it's using this thing called the Community Re uh, Resilience Building Workshop Guide. And that's where, you know, that structure that I mentioned before, looking at infrastructure, society, and environmental impacts. And, um, and looking not just at uh, your vulnerabilities, but also looking at what strengths you have in the town and how you might be able to enhance them. So uh, we're going to do this baseline assessment today and come up with some specific actions for each one of those categories. So in terms of an overview uh, of the, what we're going to do today, we've just given you the, the big high-level overview. Um, we're going to then shift into now some overview presentations <coughs> on science and some of the resources that we're going to be using for this process. So we're going to identify in the guided exercises the top hazards that the town faces, the vulnerabilities and strengths, identify actions to reduce those vulnerabilities and increase the strengths, and then finally from that pull the top actions. So, Mike is going to give us a real quick overview of the town's uh, current hazard mitigation plan. Thank you, everybody. Um, I was asked to just do a quick presentation. So, in 2016, we actually uh, did a similar exercise for, uh, it's called the Local Hazard Mitigation Plan. It does allow for uh, state grant funding, but it's extremely difficult to get it, and the cost-benefit analysis is that you have to do for it are are quite uh, quite extensive, um, so we have not been successful at that. However, it seems like this might be tracking us in a different direction. Um, most of you know the layout of the community, but for those that you that don't, as the emergency manager, I have to do risk analysis for our top hazards, and part of that went into that local uh, hazard mitigation plan. So we all know that Hadley is prone to flooding. We have the Connecticut Ruck River that runs on our west border. So annually, we're dealing with flooding. Um, normally some type of flooding. 
Uh, we manage it quite well. We do have spikes some years that we have. Uh, we'll have a major rain event that might hit, you know, cause it to come up quickly. Uh, or we might have a snowpack that is just too heavy up north and we just we can't handle all the water at once. Um, so that's our probably one of our major issues. The other major issue is we do have some, it's actually pretty amazing how such a small community has so many different hazards, but we have the mountain <laughs> range, which is pr prone to drought. We've had uh, multiple two-week extended uh, firefighting, um, you know, brush fires up in that area that could impact homes. Um, we have extensive uh, areas of, of town that have heavy brush area that could, could technically, you know, if we had a drought situation, so drought is one of our concerns. Snowfall, obviously, this year, knock on wood, we've been lucky so far, but uh, you all remember the October snowstorm, uh, Snowtober, they called it, um, where we, had, we just, it was, it was a major impact to basically every portion of our community and the communities around us where we were just completely off the grid, everybody was had no power. Uh, we were setting up, you know, shelters, warming stations. We had Halloween at the Hatley Elementary School, thanks to Annie. Uh, <laughs> so uh, that's that's another one. Um, the other big one for us is, as a fire chief as well, is the impact of the number of folks that come into our community daily. Uh, I remember when I first started as the fire chief, uh, past our our past police chief told me about the day that. They had to actually shut one lane of Route 9 down at the bridge because the Connecticut River was up extremely high and it actually had backed up over one lane. So we had one lane of traffic. So for us, the concerns that we have, that's been improved now when they redid the bridge. However, um, I just look at it as if we do have an impact like this, we are completely cut off from any type of medical services. Uh, the extent of time it would take for us to get to our secondary, uh, you know, hospital site is, is pretty, it's quite an extended time frame. So that's, that's another issue that we have is the impact of all the folks that are coming in. The other issue that I have on our, the top of our list is the number of folks that have kind of taken over the river area. Uh, so they've set up camps, they've set up summer fun. Uh, I look at it as it's all folks that I don't know who are in town and folks that if we have a weather event that comes up, either a tornado, a hurricane, a uh, heavy, you know, we've had, we've had weather events that have raised the river close to, you know, over a foot within an hour, uh, where we have boats running, you know, floating down the river. Yes? Are you in contact with the people who run the dams on the river? We get, every, every year, we get updated emergency plans for the Atkins Dam, and uh, there's one other dam. We yeah. get all of their annual plans. They're revised annually for us, so we take a look at that. And there on, is some on, on the Connecticut the River, not necessarily the smaller dams, but on the Connecticut River. On the Connecticut River, yeah. basically, we we have done one exercise on that to see what the impacts are. And I can tell you, unfortunately, it's up in your neck of the woods. It's probably the worst, mm -hmm. uh, along with the dams <laughs> that are in Amherst. But we do monitor those during weather events. So every year when we are in flooding, we are continuously. I know David and myself are continuously monitoring those dams to the north of us to see what's coming our direction. And then what it usually is is that everything to the south of us is so inundated that we start seeing the backup in our area. And I can tell you I'm a stakeholder as well because I actually live on Bay Road and had to actually take everything out of my basement so that I wasn't paying close to $5,000 a year in flood insurance. So it's, it's a big impact for all of us. So if we can somehow manage that, uh, that's probably one of our biggest priorities. I know we don't really deal too much with man-made uh, hazards on this program, but I can tell you that as a result of natural hazards, we always have to keep that in mind. You see how our, our population spikes during the school season where we have tens of thousands of people coming into town every day. It, it completely, it really strains our infrastructure as far as police, fire, DPW, everybody. So we have to keep that in mind because these weather events, this climate change that we have, uh, I mean, I, I had the opportunity to experience our first, you know, our first earthquake in Hadley, where I actually had to go around with a building inspector and inspect buildings. Whoever thought that I would be checking out buildings for an earthquake, but it happened in Hadley. So we're not exempt from anything. And we have some pretty nasty stuff that drives through Hadley, and we have some pretty nasty stuff that lives in Hadley. And it's, a, you, it's over at the university, you have half a million gallons of fuel oil, you have, uh, you know, a very large natural gas pipeline that comes in. 
and you have 52,000 gallons of liquid nat natural gas that's getting five truckloads of liquid natural gas a day delivered to it in the winter. So if we have any of these kind of weather incidents, that, that could impact us as well. So you have two firefighters in town right now that are on duty until 6 p.m. tonight, and then we go to a call force of 15. And I can tell you last night we were dealing with, uh, you know, somebody who ran into a telephone pole where we, you know, we didn't have any call force folks that showed up. So it was myself and the full-time deputy and one new, new firefighter we have. So it's straining, it's straining us. So I'm looking forward to working with you on trying to put together a plan. And if you have any other, does that, does that give a kind of a broad look at everything? Is that what we're looking for? Yeah, that was so, okay, yeah. so thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Chief. Um, so now we're going to talk a little bit about the reason behind these hazards that we're experiencing in our communities. And you know, everyone talks about climate change. You hear that it's a, it's a hot buzz topic that gets thrown around a lot. And the issue is understanding the, the difference between weather and climate. So we have a little table here breaking it down. So weather is more in the minute acute conditions. So you look outside, the weather is sunny and cold. Climate is more of a statistical analysis of the patterns and trends of the weather uh, sort of ebbs and flows of how these patterns affect communities over a longer period of time. So like it says here, weather is what you get outside, climate is what you expect. And that's why climate change has become such a push for this resiliency planning because now projections are saying that our climate is going to change. So not just our weather, but the climate and the, the, pa the patterns and trends that dictate how the weather is going to act. So for example, a weather event is a nor'easter, a hurricane. Um, climate events are these trends in droughts and how long um, uh, consecutive dry days that you have, how many days that you have in an average growing season that are above 90 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, and we have a little video that we can show that I think gives a really good explanation of this. Oh, I'm still presenting them. Oh, just So let me know if everyone can hear this. Should probably maximize it. Dire long term. Okay, so we scientists were so good at making these dire long term predictions about the climate. How come we're so lousy about the weather? Yeah, that's as bad as it goes. Cold in winter, the mines have them. For all the scientists know, they could be in for global cooling. Here's the difference between weather and climate. Weather is what the atmosphere does in the short term. If you couldn't hear that, just a <laughs> brief explanation. Why is it like this? Um, <coughs> oh, Sorry. I don't 
So, did everyone hear? Could everyone hear yeah. what was mm -hmm. going on in there? So, um, you know, the dog's meandering, that's the weather, but the, the trajectory of the person holding the leash is the climate. And so, when we're looking at climate and we're, now we're understanding the, the physical properties and the, the mechanical reasonings behind climate change, if you think about the Earth's atmosphere as like a blanket and when you're cold and you wrap a blanket around you, your own body heat is what's keeping you warm, not necessarily that blanket, because your body is generating that heat, but the blanket is trapping that atmosphere that your body's creating inside of it. So this blanket is keeping all of the gases that we produce, nothing gets destroyed when we burn them, they just, we change what uh, phase it's in, so we, we turn it into a gas and then it's in the atmosphere and that adds more carbon dioxide to the atmosphere and it's thickening that blanket. When you add more CO2 in, we're, we're enhancing this blanket, trapping all these gases. But so what's happening is as we're burning and combusting and creating all this CO2, it's driving the temperatures on the earth up. And we also have this thick blanket now that has trapped all of this heat in here and we, as a result, are seeing our oceans are getting warmer. So we can liken it to uh, like a coffee cup. So if you need a, a visual representation. So you have a cup of coffee and you add heat to it and you see the, the vapor coming off of it is evaporation. And so when water evaporates, it goes up into our atmosphere and it condenses in the sky in clouds and then we have more precipitation as a result. So hotter doesn't necessarily mean always drier. Hotter can mean way more intense rainstorms like we've been seeing. So for Massachusetts itself, we have seen since 1895 almost a three degree Fahrenheit increase in temperature. The growing season has increased by 15 days, which can help out agricultural uh, expenditures for sure. Sea level rise has almost um, increased by a foot since 1922. And heavy precipitation, which we will address in a minute, has increased by 55% since 1958. So what do we mean uh, by heavy precipitation? So changes in precipitation uh, can refer to rain events. So individual rain events that, la that uh, produce more than an inch of rain in one, in one go. So one to two inches of rain is considered a heavy precipitation event, and we've been seeing that happen more frequently. So, that can cause inland flooding, but then the lack of precipitation, as we've seen here, causes drought. Rising temperatures can couple with drought to cause wildfire conditions. It can also can create excellent situations for invasive species to come in and outcompete indigenous species that aren't used to it being warmer or wetter, etc. Uh, so extreme weather, hurricanes, tornadoes, because we have more fuel for the storm up in our atmosphere, and severe winter storms also can be a result of changing climate patterns. And we're also going to consider human-induced hazards, so development in floodplain areas and wetlands that naturally can um, take care of some of these large precipitation events by storing some of that flood water as it infiltrates and the overuse of fertilizers and pesticides that run off into waterways and can wreak havoc on the natural ecosystem. So we're going to talk about how the climate in Hadley is projected to change over the next uh, 20 years or so. So we got this data from resilientma.org. It's a great resource. So if anyone here uh, is interested in looking at some of these climate data tools. There's tons of information. There's uh, smart farming planning for climate change projections. There's great tools. So first, we're, let's talk about temperature. So this graph shows uh, historical climate data and projected climate trends using um, both maximum and minimum um, emission projections. And so what we're looking at here are how many annual days, like the average annual days, that the temperature will be above 90 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's, that's just talking about how hot it's going to be. So if we look at 2020, and you know, the data that 
is available for this is um, only goes a little past 2,000. But so if we look at 2020, we're about here for the average. And if you go to 2040, just 20 years from now, it almost doubles. So the, the temperature almost goes up to 20 days of above 90 degree Fahrenheit weather in a season, which um, can affect crops if you have uh, things set up for certain uh, row crops. And if you look at the average annual temperature, not just looking at those uh, spikes in temperature, we also see that the average temperature is steadily increasing as we get to about 20, 40, 20 years from now. We've uh, breached that 50 degree average. So in about 20 years, we're looking at an average annual temperature of over 50 degrees Fahrenheit. For precipitation, we're going to see more frequent intense precipitation events. Again, we're looking at historical data, and there are outliers here that is considered in the data. And if you look out to 2040, we're seeing the maximum emissions projections are way up here, with, in some cases, perhaps 20, over 20 days, or, excuse, excuse me, I'm reading that wrong, over two days with greater than two inches in one rainfall event, which, if you think about that, Think of how much impervious area you have and a two inch layer of storm water all sitting on there. Where does it go? And that's one of the, one of the things we're going to look at today. And again, just average annual rainfall is also expected to increase in amount of precipitation per year. For drought, I know that uh, Hadley was concerned. We are seeing uh, trends that support the theory that more frequent drought events will occur, which are annual consecutive dry days. So we're looking at intense rainfall events with stretches of no rain in between them, which is not conducive to healthy, well-managed farming. So now I'm going to turn it over to Bob, and we're going to talk about some nature-based solutions. Actually, we're going to shift back. We're now, Andrew shift back. Uh, from EOE Yang is here, so we're going to go back and get a little overview of the MVP program before we shift over. So, so I just want to uh, follow up. So my name is Andrew Smith. I work for EA, um, the Connecticut River Valley uh, Coordinator for this program. Um, just to kind of hit the hit the data that you guys were just exposed to, uh, it's really important just to conceptualize the fact that we've already had a period of baked change that's already happened in our system, right? Everything that we have was built for a certain regime that existed 40 years ago, right? And in the interim, we've had climate change happening. Uh, we spent a lot of time fighting over the causes. In the meantime, it was happening. Uh, I think uh, every, like I think 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit is the average increase in temperature. So there's a lot of stuff that we've already built that isn't functioning the way it's supposed to, and that's just a fact, right? So there's like some like current baseline uh, adaptation that needs to take place, and then there's projected adaptation, which is what you know she was talking about, which is that the stuff that needs to be built we haven't even like done yet, we haven't conceptualized yet. So it's really important to think about uh, that going forward. Um, so again, my name is Andrew Smith. I'm the regional coordinator for uh, the. Greater Connecticut River Valley, which goes all the way from down here in Southlake up to uh, Gardner and Winston. So it's a 65 towns uh, in central and western Mass. Um, uh, very fortunate to be in Hadley today, uh, the right over, right over the bridge. Um, based in Springfield, but I'm all over the place all the time. So uh, it's good to be close to here. Um, so the reason why um, uh, basically I have a job is that uh, we've uh, Massachusetts was one of the first states to uh, combine the hazard mitigation plan with climate adaptation work. So a lot of you have probably gone through the hazard mitigation planning process before, where you look at your hazards, you say we have X number of hazards, probably for Hadley flooding is pretty high as a concern. I wonder why, you know, <laughs> big river, you know. Um, it's interesting, when I, was in, when I was in grad school at UMass, one of my, one of my classmates did an analysis of the way that the town was laid out with the sort of north-south axis going from one end of the river to the next end of the river, and that was like the way the town had been laid out originally with the river as like the planning point. That was before the dikes were constructed. So I understand that you guys are a river town, and that's influenced your soils and everything else. But, you know, so, so to go back to that, off of that tangent, um, so hazard mitigation planning, climate adaptation planning, those got merged together under uh, uh, Governor Baker's office. Executive Order 519 was the sort of like universal strategy for dealing with climate change, climate adaptation. So now within each of the cabinet levels, you have you know, nine different cabinet uh, positions. 
There's somebody that's in each cabinet position who's tasked with the responsibility of figuring how to implement the SHMCAP, the State Hazard Mitigation Climate Adaptation Plan, and how to make those priorities manifest throughout the entire uh, uh, state government. So um, like DOT, MBTA, like they all have this uh, objective of making us a more climate resilient uh, place to live and do business. Um, tell me when you want me to stop. So, <laughs> so how, how many more, more slides do we do? Like two more? <coughs> totally up to you. I mean, cool. uh, two, two, two. Okay. Da, da, da. Okay. Uh, so you're going through right now, so MVP process. Um, climate adaptation work is really expensive. Uh, and it takes a lot of information and it needs to be done well. So if you have me coming from the government showing up and saying, Hadley, you're going to do this, you probably wouldn't react to that very favorably. You would say, uh, go pound sand, man, from the state government. So what we're, what we're trying to do is this is a community-led process where you go through the process, you identify your needs, you identify the ideas for things that you might think would work for your town, and we help you implement that through funding. So it's a partnership between the state and local governments um, because that's New England way. Like, you guys home rule. Like, you know your town better than we do, and we want to help you implement your priorities. Is so, this going to be a process that keeps changing, or once the plan is set, it's set in stone? What, what do you mean? Well, what if we may decide on something right now, yes. and then uh, you may find out, whoops, we made a mistake. That's totally fine. So, so what, what we is, have, is this going to be a process that is going to be continu continuous? There are towns that have updated their plans already because they've decided that different people have come in and they've thought about it a different way. Mm -hmm. There's an annual update um, where you can just sort of list changes. I think some towns have decided to use their annual update as a way of resorting their priorities. But it's not like an OSRP yet. I don't think, we haven't reached that bridge yet, so pretty new. But right now, uh, OSRPs, you have to update every five years. It has a mitigation plan every five years. Um, right now, that's not where we are. It's just this annual update. Uh, so yeah, we want you to think about the climate data, we want you to think about nature-based solutions. You're going to hear a lot about nature-based solutions, working with nature. Um, and we want to be able to find programs and projects that can be replicated across the state. That's one of our goals. Because um, there's a lot of local wisdom. So right now you're in the MVP planning process right now. So once you finish the planning process, which is you go through your CRB workshop, which we're going to do today, you can do action grant funding. And action grant funding is, um, it's a, right now it's an annual uh, annual co competitive grant program. We just finished up uh, making decisions and announcements on uh, who's gonna receive funding. So there's gonna be a lot of press around that between now and February, I believe. February is the official press date. Um, and sometimes we're doing it for some you know, pretty cool things. Like Deerfield has had, a, a, for the past three years, a priority of fixing, um, Colberts, they had Hurricane Irene 2011. They recognized that they still are dealing with the impacts of that uh, storm, uh, even almost 10 years later. And they've gone through and they've decided that they're going to replace all their culverts, right? And this gets back to the fact that what we've built hasn't really uh, changed with our changing climate. So, this town of Deerfield has done that. The city of Northampton across the river has done a lot of work on uh, green infrastructure. They're doing some green infrastructure in schools. They're doing some work on Dykes under this current year. Southwick is replacing culverts. There's a lot of towns in the region that are doing this. Bowser Town is upsizing their, um, their water tower uh, to sort of harden their infrastructure. Um, and in three years, uh, you know, a lot of towns have decided to become part of the, the planning program. Uh, I think at the end of this year, we'll have 80% of the towns enrolled in the program. So this is from zero to 80 percent in a three-year program is pretty successful. Um, just to go back, we've had action grants in Northampton, Belchertown, um, Holyoke, Springfield, they're upgrading their urban forestry, Southwick, Culverts, Deerfield, Culverts, Montague, um, some work on upgrading uh, uh, roadways because looking at doing green infrastructure and roadways to decrease localized flooding. So a lot of towns are working on localized flooding. You guys work on coordinating things with other towns because if we do something here, it may affect someone downstream where if we do it a little different, yep. it might not be as much of an impact either upstream or downstream. Yeah, that's that's all part of the 
permitting process. Like say for example you're doing like a culvert replacement, like the engineer that you would have hire would have to do like a like a hydrocat analysis. I mean I'm not an engineer so I'm just sat in the room with them and they have to go through, they look at the watershed and they say if we increase this slug of water in this area, how much farther downstream can the impacts be? And then like you have to make those adjustments. So it's it's all gotta be you know, if you dump all your water in your neighbor, then they're probably not gonna like it. You know, so we're we're all geared <laughs> towards <laughs> Uh, the good old New England way of working with your neighbor, right? Um, uh, so action grant types. Uh, let's see. Okay, so this this is always evolving right now, but right now we've got so the most recent grant of funding, grant round of funding that just closed out. We're gonna have another one in April. Uh, so say for example today you go through and you say we've got problems with our culverts or we've got problems with our dams or we've got problems with um, uh, you name it you know uh, you can do a detailed risk assessment you can say say for example we have a thousand culverts in town a thousand bridges in town uh, but we don't know what their condition is so you can go through and you can do a detailed risk assessment so you can start to prioritize replacement community outreach and education so say for example you the, t the city of Worcester, they have a uh, giant Ghanaian population. The president of Ghana comes every year for his birthday. It's just a big part of Worcester, you know? And um, say, for example, they want to do a, an outreach program to, it's probably 2% of the population, several thousand people, uh, and that's part of the community. And if something happens in Ghana, it's going to affect that community. So say, for example, the city of Worcester wanted to do, to do that outreach, then they could do outreach to that population to figure out how to build resiliency. Uh, and it's local bylaws, uh, the town of Deerfield, they're updating their local bylaws uh, to increase uh, green infrastructure and low impact development uh, so that there's uh, like more resilience built to the landscape because you have a more porous landscape instead of a hardscape. Uh, redesigns and retrofits, this, get, this gets back to bridges. Say for example, there's a bridge that's gonna cost $10 million to replace. You're not gonna wanna bite them in one chunk, you know? You're gonna wanna do first the redesign and the permitting and figure out how far down the road you can go uh, Nature-based solutions, so you're gonna hear a lot about this. This is, again, I don't wanna steal your thunder, but good nature-based solutions. Uh, and this is, this one's in interesting. This, so this is really kind of fascinating because we're figuring out how to deal with this. Um, solutions to extreme heat, extreme weather. Um, this current round, no one took advantage of it, but right now, say for example, you have a large public housing complex and uh, it doesn't have air conditioning. So we would want to be able to say, if you have, you know, let's say there's, say there's 800 people who live in this public housing complex, there's no air conditioning, you have several degrees, several days in the summer where it's above 90 degrees. At a certain point, you're going to start to see public health impacts from that because people are not going to be able to survive uh, being in a really hot building for that period of time. So, so a strategy might be like, well, let's make some investments in our public housing complex to have cooling shelters, right? So that's just one strategy. No one's taken advantage of it yet, but it's something that could happen because um, we want to help. Again, the impacts of climate change starts at the bottom, works its way up. I used to work in the city of Holyoke. That's my background. Um, we had 2,800 people come from Puerto Rico as a result of the hurricane. And they had nothing when they got there. Their lives were destroyed. They were coming to stay with friends and family members. But for the most part, the valley just kind of coasted along fine. Uh, but during that duration of time, they are an extreme crisis situation. Um, so there's going to be a lot of impacts that we just don't see until it gets really bad. So the part, of, the part of our job is to understand what are going to be the impacts of the going to the bottom of the socioeconomic ladder and how can we help those people be more resilient uh, so that their lives aren't hard. Uh, All right. Um, Nature-based solutions. We have nature-based solutions spread up around the state. Um, here's a good example from Mattapoisett. So what they've done is they've, um, rather than you know, investing in expensive seawalls and that sort of thing, they're doing some uh, some wetlands restoration, 120 acres of, of wetlands. Uh, they're conserving that to prevent you know, storm surge from impacting the town. Instead of building a big seawall, they're using nature to prevent the impacts. Millbury, this, this town is, I mean, they had a really cool project. Millbury um, is to the east of here. Um, they had a lot of impacts. 
from uh, localized flooding from what's the name? Blackstone River. Blackstone River. And they went through and they got funding to uh, increase um, low impact development and green infrastructure in their downtown because they're trying to decrease the impacts of this flashy stream going forward. Uh, so it was a huge project. They got like $2 million of funding. It's still going forward. And it'll be interesting to see what the impacts of that are uh, from here from here out because we're hoping that we can have a good demonstration project for how other towns can do it too. Uh, Boston, all right, I don't want to bore you guys too much because you guys got a big day ahead of you. But Boston, they did this sort of like uh, stormwater recharge park, you know. Uh, I, I, I didn't design this, I had nothing to do with this. But basically, it's a park that's going to be a public park that's also going to accommodate the storm surge. So there's, you're looking for the co-benefits, open space, um, preservation, but also a place for the water to go when you have a big event that's going to challenge people. So just think think outside the box of what can we do with this big like space that we're going to need to accommodate storm surges. Uh, da, 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 da. Again, going back to Belchertown, this one's crazy because what they realized is that uh, they needed to upgrade their water tower, but they also realized that 25% of their town's water goes to watering their school athletic fields. Um, so they, so they, they're going to increase the size of their water tower, but they're also going to look at uh, doing like a rain cistern system for collecting water and using it to water the athletic fields. So there was increased, increased the hardship of the infrastructure while decreasing the load on the piece that they're upgrading. Because I guess they found out that, uh, say for example, there's a 90 mile an hour windstorm, the concern is that the water tower is going to fall over and they would not have water. But also makes sense to why would you put 25% of your water on the athletic field? So it's kind of a cool example. And then going back uh, to Holyoke, this is one that it's kind of, it's, there aren't many uh, examples of programs like this. Um, I got, you know, this was something that I worked on a little bit, but our, our assumption was that Hurricane Maria gave us a chance to peek around the corner at future climate migration events. And um, we are, 2017, uh, you know, thousands of people came from all over the place, and uh, it's just it's like an 80-page report, and I highly recommend you guys read it, just because if you want to if you want to ask yourselves well, what would happen if we had 2,000 people come to our town, it's a good summary of what actually happens. Uh, so okay, right now, um, right now, so say for example, you get say for example, Town of Hadley applies for an action grant, and you get Two million dollars, right, to replace replace a piece of critical infrastructure to make it you know, harden for uh, flooding. You know, uh, right now you'd have to complete that within the fiscal year, um, which has been challenging for some towns because your your towns, you know, and that uh, and that has been something that people have had concerns about, and that we've heard it from a lot of small cities and towns about like actually pulling that off within the fiscal year. Uh, so Senate Bill Ten, it's something that has been. Uh, Proposed, uh, Governor Baker has proposed it, and it's in the Senate right now. And what that would do, uh, it would create like a surcharge on property tax transfers, um, and it would create like a trust fund that would be used for climate adaptation. And that would move it out of the sort of operating budget to the capital budget, so the cities and towns could get more time. I don't know, are you are you guys a green community? Are you a green community? No. Okay, so if you're not, okay. Well, anyway, but green communities, you don't have to complete it within a year. You can complete project, projects within, you know, two or three years. So, so it's, it would be something similar to that. And also right now, um, uh, this is something that's going forward. So, so here's the deal, like climate adaptation, where it's the, the data that you saw, like the future, <coughs> the future scenarios, they're not hardwired yet. Like we still get to choose our future. It's like, so there's like sort of like this interplay between climate mitigation and climate adaptation. Climate mitigation is carbon uh, greenhouse gas emissions reductions. Adaptation is dealing with the changes in our climate as a result of what we do or don't do. But still, the cheapest thing to do is to reduce the reduce the greenhouse gas emissions in the present moment, because then that reduces the cost of our adaptation later in life. So right now we've got this 20 by 50 decarbonization, or sorry, 2050 decarbonization plan that's going to be going in the next 18 months. And that's called the 80 by 50 study, which is 80% reduction by 2050. There's going to be several different pathways towards um, reducing that greenhouse gas emission level below 80% um, by 2050. 
and uh, yeah, that's that's what we're doing. We're doing we're doing a lot of a lot of work. This is all under the Global Warming Solutions Act, which was passed in 2007, which gives us goals and benchmarks for how we're trying to mitigate the impacts of climate change. So it's exciting stuff. It's all kind of cutting edge. There are not a lot of states. I guarantee you, there's not a lot of um, places uh, right now doing what you're doing at this moment in time. So it's kind of cool that you guys are doing. You're among the first, right? You're showing people the future. And uh, basically, I'm here to help. Uh, I'm, your, I'm your coordinator. I'm based in Springfield, but I'm all over, all over the region. And uh, it's our, our goal is to work with the Citizens Conference partners uh, to help you implement your actions. You have a question? Yeah, just a question. Uh, within that 50 roadmap, or 2050 roadmap, are there um, programs uh, specifically geared towards agriculture? So, so this is something that's really fascinating because as you know, uh, one of our one of our land management strategies that we have in place right now is um, uh, results in you know, greenhouse gas emissions coming up uh, uh, from agriculture, right? So, so some people are looking at is no-till agriculture no-till agriculture solution for capturing some of the green. I think it's sulfur dioxide that comes off of ag lands. I think 20% of our greenhouse gas emissions can be attributed to sulfur dioxide, and 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 if we did no-till agriculture, what would those impacts be? So I, I don't know the exact uh, outcome of that because the plan is in the next 18 months. The plan is going to be completed, but you know, agriculture has a huge has a huge like it's a role to play as both like a mitigation and an adaptation strategy. So it's exciting to think that here's Hadley. You guys like you look at the map, you might take it for granted, but there's not a lot of places in, in the Northeast that have like great soils, have good farming. Uh, it's just you know, Hadley, Hatfield, Northfield, Whateley, like you guys are kind of drive up from New York. It's the first good farmland you see, and that's just, I mean, maybe some in Connecticut, but, uh, so yeah, I would say there's definitely a role for that, but that's going to be determined going forward. Um, well, and another just aspect of that is that, you know, one of the barriers for change oftentimes is going to be the financing aspects of it, and I'm just wondering, you know, with the farm credit system, if there's any sort of partnering arrangement going on with them to provide any sort of, you know, as these programs are developed. Yeah, I think it's interesting. There's there's another resilient uh, resilient mass landscape planning pro project that's going on right now. And we're trying to figure out how can we help um, drive change in a way that's equitable. You know, because just saying like do this is never equitable. And I think part of the goal is to make it equitable. Mm -hmm. So right now the answer is undetermined, but the recognition of the need is there to work as partners. Is that eight percent reduction? statewide including residents and business or just for municipalities and state um i think i mean it's so green communities is just for municipalities 80 by 50 would be statewide uh, that's the goal um, and again one of the driving factors is people don't understand the extent to which we think about this but equitability is probably one of the things we think about first everybody has seen the news in the past year over the uh, the protest in france over increases in gas gas prices um, that were understood to be not equitable, right? So I think equitability is something that people want to do first. So just kind of keep that in mind. It's, you know, if you believe this, it's like we think about it all day long. So just kind of <laughs> understand that like we're always I'm trying to understand a way to make it equitable. Uh, so again, we're saying, get, so yeah, so you get your planning grant, you complete the workshop. There we go. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna back out and I'm gonna turn it over again. So thanks. All right, back there. So, I am going to just give a very quick um, overview, of picking up a little bit on this idea of nature-based solutions, and we're running a little bit behind schedule, so I'm going to go over this maybe at a high level. And I think some of you know what Andrew already talked about were some good examples of that. So, just get into maybe a little more detail on that. So, when we talk about nature-based solutions, some uh, lingo that's been thrown around in recent years, that sometimes it's referred to as green infrastructure or low-impact development. Often you're talking about the same concepts of trying to make the developed landscape behave more like an undeveloped landscape. So um, the best way to you know, end up with good water quality and have you know, resilient landscapes is to not develop the land, you know, keep intact forests, keep intact buffers along streams and rivers. But um, if you don't do that, if you're going to live in a house and have roads you can drive on like we all do, then you can kind of retrofit, redesign the landscape to make it behave a little more like an undeveloped land, um, which basically that means uh, finding ways to slow down the flow of water, infiltrate the water back into the ground, and not letting it collect and pick up, you know, fast and uh, you know, large erosive flows. So you got these 
impervious surfaces, everything from your rooftop to tennis courts, paved roads and, and driveways that shed water and, and uh, make it uh, collect and transport pollutants and, and also have uh, these erosive velocities. So how can we do this low impact or the development of green infrastructure on like your, your home lot? So here's an example of a typical residential lot. You know, typically you'd get in there, the lot would be cleared, cut down all the trees to make it easier to grade, put in, you know, septic system, build the house and so on. So you have a limited number of trees left, a lot of grass. Um, the roof may drain to the street where water will catch uh, or collect in a catch basin and eventually discharge to a, a water, surface water or wetlands. So in a green infrastructure or a low impact development uh, concept, you'd have more vegetation left on the site, you know, more, more of the natural uh, canopy of trees there. You can collect some of your um, rooftop runoff and rain barrels and use it later for watering, similar to what Andrew was saying, I forget which town had, um, had the 25% um, you know, watering for uh, sport fields. Well, you can do that same concept on a smaller scale in your own home. Use, use the water to you know, water your lawn, vegetable garden, whatever. Um, you can do add soil amendments to basically fluff up and, and increase the infiltration rate of your soil on your lawn. Um, you can do things like building a dry well, basically an area where water might just naturally be collecting to a low spot in your landscape and, and promoting infiltration there. Um, using different techniques for um, paving uh, your parking area with uh, either permeable asphalt or uh, different permeable pavers that don't just shed water as readily. So um, different things you can do. That you can do this on just about any lot to varying degrees depending on the kind of soils you have and, and, the, land, and the, the slopes and so on. So a few just very quick examples. This is what we call rain garden. It's essentially just a bowl-shaped depression in the ground that have uh, vegetation that's well adapted to both you know, drought conditions and be being able to withstand periodic uh, um, flooding or ponding, and then it eventually just you know, infiltrates back in. So you can build those tiny, you know, whatever amount of space you have available, you can tend to build these, big, small. Um, its close cousin is bioretention. It's essentially the same thing. It's a bowl-shaped feature in the landscape with a little more engineering, and that tends to happen in two ways. Um, you'll get in and over-excavate and actually engineer the soils. So you put in a, a very highly infiltrating gravel bed, and then what we call bioretention soil on top of it, which tends to be kind of a, a sandy, loamy mix. Enough loam, enough organic um, content to let plants grow, but sandy enough to let that water you know, rapidly infiltrate. Um, in some cases, there'll be an additional engineering feature, which will be what we call riser pipe. So it'll be designed to only allow ponding to a certain level, maybe six inches, before the water goes into a pipe and then connect to a pipe network. But you'll see that, um, that kind of engineering done in places where you want to pre prevent flooding. So if it's going to, if ponding beyond that, the top of that riser pipe would lead to flooding in a street or a parking area, that's, that would uh, be the solution. A few quick examples. Uh, here's a sloped area uh, along the side of a lake at Lunenburg where a grass channel was put in. And this previously had just had a pipe which was discharging stormwater runoff right off the road directly to the lake. Now it's coming down a grass swale, um, making a, a U-shaped turn, collecting, settling. Small space, but taking advantage of it to allow this to happen during a pretty intense storm event. You can see the ponding happening. And this is right after planting, so these shrubs aren't really bushed out yet. But really, very little, if any, um, surface flow. It's all just collecting and infiltrating, and the vegetation is doing its job, taking those nutrients and putting them to work, as opposed to dumping them in the lake where they could lead to an algae bloom. So, just another quick example, um, of one that has a more um, perennial flower planting plan. Sometimes you can build these things in pre-cast boxes. This, this one is put in at the end of a parking lot for Town Beach. Um, another version of this, capturing roof runoff, uh, town building in Plymouth. Um, we talked about how cisterns and rain barrels can be used. Uh, lots of different types of ways that you can um, uh, make paving more perme uh, permeable. These are just interlocking concrete pavers that have void spaces in between with gravel and sand that uh, you know, essentially allow water to flow through. Concrete asphalt, I'm uh, sorry, porous asphalt and porous concrete are essentially like a, imagine a rice cookie, uh, a rice crispy treat with 
pieces of Rice Krispie and void spaces in between. So you're taking the smallest particles of asphalt and concrete and taking them out of the mix so it allows water to flow through. Um, vegetative buffers. You know, we talked about maintaining natural landscapes as being the best way of building green infrastructure. So finding areas of shoreline that you can replant. Finding areas that might be at risk of deforestation and clearing, putting them into conservation status or otherwise you know, using um, real estate tools to protect them. Um, another example right here in town, the uh, Alexander Dawson Conservation Area. So land acquisition, conservation easements, and so on. It's another green infrastructure or nature-based solution tool. And then uh, the final step here uh, is like, looking at nature and what it needs to behave under these more intense and more frequent storm events. So here's an example of an undersized culvert that might have been built. Like Andrew was saying, we, were, we built our infrastructure a long time ago on, you know, to respond to and handle different conditions. So the new design standards for a stream of this size is to, do, to build it so that the span is 1.2 times the bankful width. So that would be really about to handle the high flows plus a little more. So these are good not only for making sure that the infrastructure doesn't get blasted out during a hurricane or a nor'easter, but it's also better for wildlife passage. So it's, it's really serving multiple goals. So with that said, we're going to now transition to talking a little bit about the resources we're going to have at the tables when we go through our exercises, which are going to start very shortly. So Dave, can you take that? Yes. All right. Okay, so we're almost done, I promise. Now we're almost going to move on to the fun stuff. Uh, so, as Bob mentioned, just want to go over some quick um, uh, math resources for the workshop. Um, so you'll notice at the tables here that we've got a couple different resources. So each table has a big map, just of the town of Hadley here. Um, so basically, it's you know, just a, you know, uh, basically just a relatively simple map showing Hadley, roads, uh, streams, and then it's got a couple of key locations on there, such as uh, schools. Um, so the idea here is that as we move through the workshop, you know, we can kind of write notes on the map and just kind of get ideas uh, from these maps. Um, in addition to this map, we also have a smaller map package at the table here with some additional maps, uh, so including the theme of flood hazard layer. Uh, we have a map of zoning in a pervious area, uh, critical habitat, which Hadley has a lot of, as well as uh, water supply areas. So I'd say just kind of use those maps just to kind of get, um, you know, just, uh, just kind of um, um, uh, get ideas as we kind of work, work through these uh, exercises this afternoon. And the other thing I want to mention at the table, if anyone's interested, We've got the workshop guide here, so we'll basically be just going, you know, basically stepping through this. Um, so feel free to kind of uh, follow along. And the whole idea of this workshop is we'll be doing a bunch of exercises to fill out this risk matrix. So in this guide, towards the end, there's actually a couple of example risk uh, matrices. It's just so, you know, just to kind of, uh, give you guys some ideas. So there's example risk matrices here, and then some other ones here at the table. So all sorts of good resources to uh, help out as we actually do some exercises. And with that, I will pass it over to Anisha to talk about interview results. All right, well, some of you were present for the kickoff meeting that we had a couple of months ago, and I had the pleasure of sitting down and interviewing a few of you to get a feel for the really specific nitty-gritty details of your personal experiences in Hadley and what you value in your community and what you feel needs to be addressed in this workshop. So we talked about the vulnerabilities, and we have our top three, uh, uh, sorry, our top three uh, sections of that we're assessing for the uh, for the matrix are infrastructural, environmental, and societal. So we went through a checklist and we decided that for infrastructure, the things that we identified were drainage uh, for townwide critical facilities and historical assets, so preserving some of the cultural landmarks that you have around town.
For environmental damages, we talked about loss of floodplains, preventing development in hazard areas, and of course, protecting and strengthening agricultural uh, ex expenditures. And the final vulnerability that we sort of identified was public utilities. Uh, we talked about public water supply and drinking water supply and how power outages have affected the community in the past and uh, sort of strengthening and again promoting em emergency services and their response times. The primary concern as has come up in conversations today already is flooding and uh, we will look into that in more depth as we get to the next portion. For the strengths of the town, we identified the fire department and emergency services has a great track of response, so it's good to know that the governance um, around emergency response is already a strength of the town, and so what we can do is come up with solutions that will help preserve that strength in the future with these other modifications that we are making to the town plan. And another strength was communication uh, between different departments within the town hall. Many of you said that uh, there's good reliability between communicating information from one department to another in terms of making decisions. And each department sort of has their own emergency response in place as dictated by the hazard mitigation plan and some of the emergency response protocols that are already set forth. So, we're working from a good base, and all of the work that we do here today will help strengthen these two aspects in addition to addressing the vulnerabilities that we identified before. <coughs> um, so, do you want to go? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so now we're getting to the part that we actually get to, you know, move, move through some exercises. Uh, so we're running a little bit behind schedule here, about 15 minutes behind schedule. So are you guys all okay if we kind of go for another 15 minutes and then we'll take a break? Is that, is that okay? We haven't done, um, okay. Because you guys have gotten a lot, of, a lot of information this last hour here, so thank you for hanging in there. <laughs> um, so what we'll be doing for the rest of this workshop is really just stepping through a series of um, basically these risk matrices exercises. So the idea here is that we'll be working to fill out these matrices as a group. Um, so step one is to identify hazards and that will go up here in this part of the matrix and then we will identify uh, vulnerabilities and strengths of the town right here and then the final exercise uh, will actually be to identify solutions. Um, and we will go into all these um, kind of as we, as we step through them. So what I thought we could do now, um, just to save some time, is just kind of as a whole, try to identify kind of the top three hazards that we'll be trying to focus on as part of this workshop. So Alicia is going to basically just grab the poster board. Do you want to use this one? Sure. Yeah. And we've had a lot of good information today already, you know, so, uh, for example, you know, we've heard that flooding is a big hazard. Um, so, basically, we'll just kind of write down some hazards and then kind of, as, as a whole, we can vote on the top three that we'll focus on um, as part of this workshop. Um, so, I'd say just uh, shout, shout them out if you want. Uh, I think flooding is definitely one. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else come to mind for hazards? Yes. Uh, dam and dike, or dike failure. Okay. Uh, so that would be more of a vulnerability. Uh, oh, so, so it'd almost be like the hazard would be flooding, for example. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Drought. Drought. That's perfect. Yep. Um, you guys have mentioned uh, snowtober, so. That could be something like strong storms, for example, you know, just seeing kind of more frequent, um, intense storms. What storms in the past have really disrupted business as usual? What type of storm? Blizzard. Blizzards? Blizzards? Okay. All of the above. <laughs> Blizzards, ice, rain, wind, wind storms? Microbursts, we've had a Okay. Yeah, so one way that we can handle that too is kind of call it strong storms in general, and it kind of dresses all of them. That's kind of the umbrella. Um, 
anything else come to mind? We kind of talked about drought. That could also be, you know, extreme, extreme heat, extreme cold. Is, is traffic considered a hazard? Um, I, I think I think we're trying to focus on the natural, hazards. Hazards. natural hazards. Thank you. Yes, natural hazards. <laughs> but yes, traffic is a hazard. <laughs> <laughs> but like for example, a really bad ice storm that you know can't control with sand or, or salt. That's that's a traffic hazard right there. You know, right. but it's that's more of a vulnerability. Can you include the wildfire portion under the drought section, or is that separate? Definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that would almost be like a, a vulnerability or a cause of, of a hazard. So yeah, yep. And so all of these sort of fit into extreme temperatures. Extreme temperatures, right. Are we going to be living with that? <laughs> and in, in, the, in the future, I mean, uh, a lot of what we're talking is what we, we've been learning how to adapt to. Right, right. So I think and I think that's what we'll kind of, um, the next step of the workshop, we'll try to figure out you know, some uh, solutions as well um, to adapt to those extreme temperatures and flooding and, and all, this, all this stuff. <coughs> Any other hazards come to mind? Yeah, I mean, I don't, I'm not really sure if this is a hazard or a vulnerability, but I'm also um, I'm thinking about human behavior from the standpoint of um, people's willingness to make changes, and I'm thinking about what Mike was talking about earlier, where we have property owners along the Connecticut River. Right. Um, so maybe that goes under flooding, maybe it goes under something else, but I mean, you have people who may not be willing to do what is necessary to accommodate. Right. So I don't know where that fits. Yeah, no, that's, that's a good point. So that would be a vulnerability to uh, the hazard. So. All these, all these ideas are going to be really good for the next uh, exercise that we do. It seems like you guys already have amazing yeah. ideas. <laughs> yes? Um, I'm just wondering about um, occasionally we get um, strong winds outside of the growing season and we get really dust storms, mm -hmm. um, which is an air quality thing, yeah, okay. I guess. I don't know whether that's a hazard again or a vulnerability or whatever. Yeah, I think um, strong winds leads to dust. So that could kind of go under the strong storm uh, category. Yeah, so it almost sounds like all these things are falling under kind of three. Oh, yes? Well, I was just going to say, I don't know if extreme temperatures is in the right place because it could relate to one of the examples you gave earlier about thinking about people that don't have air conditioning or farm mm -hmm. workers being out during the day trying to, and that doesn't have to do with flooding or drought or anything. It's its own Thing. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. I agree. Right. Yeah. So yeah. that's I was saying like if we included extreme temps as like the hazard umbrella, that includes, you know, issues with like ice storms and, and more extreme temps. It's more of like an umbrella. But it could also right? be yeah. its own thing too. So it, it could, could be almost be like thing. flooding, yeah. strong storms and then extreme temps. That almost kind of covers all of them, doesn't it? Yeah. Okay. Any any other ideas or I don't want to make the vote for everyone, so. Well, do we have any hazardous waste that we need to worry about? Like, for instance, is there any radioactive material being stored at UMass um, that could be somehow? That, so that would be a vulnerability to, like, let's say there was a huge storm that took out, like, the satellite waste accumulation area for UMass. Then then it's like, oh, it's fish radioactive, you know? So that, that would be, but it's a good point. And we should bring that up in table conversations. All of these, are excellent points, and you should be discussing these at your table. <laughs> yeah, I'm excited for the next step here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, do we all agree on flooding? Yeah. As a hand? Should yeah. we do raise of hands? Sure. Raise your hand. Raise your hand for flooding. Unanimous. <laughs> <laughs> flooding has it. Okay. Um, and then, you know, kind of under the umbrella of strong storms, that would include, you know, pretty much all these things. So, you know, we're talking about ice, we're talking about wind, we're talking mm -hmm. about yeah, um, micro microbursts. So does that sound like another good, good Are we voting on a certain number right now? Yeah, so, uh, so um, <laughs> we, we want to get down to the top three. Okay. Uh, so basically yeah. trying to merge them all, merge them all together as much as we can. So strong storms. Strong storms, we cover all that. We cover all of it. Yeah. Okay. And then I think extreme camps would address some of the concerns you had that outside of like the storm events, just extreme temperature shifts for like societal pressures or 
Yeah, I mean, um, in contrast to the fact that I brought it up, um, I actually, like, if we're only going for three, yeah. I wanted to make sure that we get to vote on drought also. <laughs> yes, yeah, so I think that would also go with extreme temps. Kind yeah. of. I think yeah. there's different. Yeah. Yeah. But but not necessarily. So. Okay. That's a rainfall yeah. thing. Not That's true. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I mean, yeah. extreme you, you hot temperatures yeah. cause drought for you sure. Yeah. Extreme temp to cause drought. That's yeah. true. So they're actually. So we do kind of have a rabbit here in the hat, and the matrix, if we want to, has spots for four hazards. So if we can't come up with three, we can definitely have have both of those on there. Uh, do you want to uh, do a vote right now on drought versus extreme temps? See. Yeah, we do. Why can't, why can't you have three? Drop, flooding, and strong storms. Yeah. 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 You have three. Drop, wildfires, flooding, okay. and strong yep. storms. Okay. All right. The, is there, show of hands for who's okay with that. That's fine. Yeah. For drought? Yeah. Okay. Well, go to the extreme temperature if you want. I just want to get to go. These are our three. Are we happy? Sure. Is there any <laughs> dissent? <laughs> <laughs> is there a separate one? Um, I think that aren't, isn't extreme, extreme temps is an, a, it's an a extension of the cause, and you so know, we, we might we might not have a summer. We may not have extreme temps. So Edwin, what I mean is, if you have people that you're trying to get out on your farm to work your farm, and we have 30, 90 degree days. Yeah. Or 100 degree days. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying it should mm -hmm. be in the top three. I'm just saying yeah. I do think it's yeah. a separate thing. And it's fine, like, that's not the top three. Well, it's a board of health issue. If board of health was here, I think that they Right, just yeah. trying to represent a different, yeah. yeah. So exactly. what, what we can do is in our individual table conversations, when we get to the, yeah. you know, the strong storms drought aspect of it, and environmental vulnerability would be, you know, human health and safety working in, you know, agricultural outfits. Like, that's. That's an environmental, that's a societal. So there, there are tons of ways to represent all these issues in the matrix. They don't have to be the hazards. So. Okay. So do we feel good with these three? Okay. So uh, we can take a break now for 10 minutes. And then what we'll do is uh, we'll get into two groups. So we'll kind of ask you guys all to squeeze into the table. So I think there's about 16 people here, so we should all fit, so I'd say. Do we want to split up? I think we should split up conservation. No oh. Guns, but. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, okay. yeah. Yeah. I think it'd be good to sort of spread out, like, uh, yep, you know, I agree. some of the, so. Yeah. So I'd say just uh, after, after the break, uh, we'll, you know, we'll sit okay. at this table and this table, uh, and then we'll kind of work through the exercises. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> thank you for listening. Yeah, all thank that. you. Thank you.